Hello, I'm Scott Lehi, columnist and editorial writer at the Boston Globe. Thanks very much for joining us for today's Op Talk. I'm speaking with Zach Carter, senior reporter at HuffPost and the author of The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes, a brilliant new biography of Keynes. I'm going to hold it up right here so everyone can see it. I have to say, I've enjoyed this book more than anything I've enjoyed since I read uh, Ron Chernow's biography of Grant. Uh, it's a really, it's a terrific book if you're interested in history, economics, or the Bloomsbury set, which Keynes was a part of in London. You'll love it. Trust me, it, it's really terrific. So, Zach, thank you for, for joining us. And I expect most anyone who's on, who's on this, uh, this talk knows something about Keynes, but just let me say a little bit about him. He was the great 20th century economist who changed thinking about the way governments should respond, particularly to economic downturns. Pre-Keynesian thinking, at least as I understand it, had been that the government uh, in time of recession or depression should make sure the, the budget was close to balance and then let the natural forces of supply and demand solve the problems. Markets would clear, as they like to say, as the expression went, and if there was high unemployment, wages would fall to a level where workers were, um, where people were, employers were willing to hire again in short order, things would be, would get back to normal and the recovery would ensue. Um, obviously, the extended length of the Great Depression gave the lie to that, that kind of thinking and, uh, and develop, helped Keynes develop some of his key insights. And here, Zach, I turn it over to you. Could you tell us what, uh, what he thought and what he, what he said that was contrary to, to the prevailing um, orthodoxy then? Well, the trick with Keynes is, uh, with a question like this, is that you always have to ask yourself, which Keynes? Because Keynes, I think more than any other sort of public intellectual in the 20th century, and certainly in the 21st century, where I think this is even less common, um, was quite willing to change his mind um, very radically and very openly. Um, at the end of World War I, for instance, um, he's very critical of the debt settlement, um, or lack thereof, between the Allies and also between the Allies and, and Germany, the defeated Germany. Uh, he thinks there's just basically not enough money to go around to, to uh, support a prosperous Europe, and this will lead to uh, international division and another war. Uh, he's not talking about debt and deficits, the thing that he becomes famous for, even though, uh, or that he's remembered for, even though he becomes famous for this, this very important critique of the Treaty of Versailles, the book that he writes, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, really rockets him from the obscurities of the, uh, the, the British bureaucracy to international national fame. Um, and he spends much of the next decade trying to figure out how to fix the disastrous global economic order um, that has sort of come out of the war. Um, he, he views the sort of pre-World War I economic order with a very uh, uh, somewhat naive, but, uh, but, but certainly a very rosy interpretation of the way things worked before World War I. Um, and, and certainly every aspect of that system, and some aspects of that system certainly did work, uh, were falling apart over the course of the 20s and 30s. I think in the United States, we think of the Great Depression starting in 1929 around the stock market crash. But in Britain, they were suffering from double-digit double unemployment almost you know, from the, you know, the end of the war on. So there's this very, very long period where Keynes is trying to figure out what exactly was wrong with the way economists understood the economic system um, and why it hadn't corrected. If you spent you know, 10 or 12 years not having the economy somehow snap back to prosperity, then no matter what the government was doing to screw things up, um, it couldn't just be that, that uh, you know, the market was naturally inclined to some sort of, uh, of natural prosperous equili equilibrium. So at first, he's, he starts looking at money. And in 1923, he publishes this very important book called A Tract on Monetary Reform, which in many ways is one of the most important sort of treatises of a philosophical doctrine, or at least economics doctrine known as monetarism, which Milton Friedman would, rather, would later become famous for, sort of using it as a critique against what Keynes comes up with later. And this is basically the idea that if the government can focus on keeping prices stable, then everything else is going to work out. The, the, the magic of the market will come into being. And governments essentially prior to 1923 hadn't been focusing on keeping prices stable with monetary policy. They've been looking at trade flows and trying not to run out of gold and things like that. Then so, he kind of moves away from that idea, right? As, as, as that doesn't work either. Very quickly, uh, very quickly. Um, and by 1930, he's calling for governments to take on large deficits and spend big on public works projects in order to uh, in, in order to reverse the sort of global economic slide that's happening. Also to sort of deal with the breakdown in international trade that's happening. A lot of stuff that they were just used to in the international trading system working as a matter of course no longer work 
after all of these international alliances break down. Uh, and, and you have different countries at each other's throats for different reasons after, even after the war. So Keynes eventually comes to, to write the general theory in 1936, justifying all of these policy ideas. He's advocating for this big government kind of role um, as early as 1929. He doesn't come up with a really scientific theory for it that is persuasive until 1936 with the general theory where he says, look, people aren't just sort of rational profit maximizing, uh, you know, money makers. They are, uh, they are people who are not necessarily concerned with scarcity, but with uncertainty, that the fundamental condition of human beings um, is not the lack of ability to produce resources, but our inability to know what's coming down the pike. And, and if you take uncertainty as the core economic principle, then all sorts of things that we know to happen in the economy that he could see happening all around him in the depression start to make theoretical sense. And, the, and economics as sort of a science can, can begin to move in, in directions that are more helpful. So that's it's when he- It's psychological starts. insight as well as an economic insight in, in, in some way that, that, that he has. Very much so, and it, it's rooted to work that he was doing on in, with, in the Cambridge philosophy department even before the war started. He, you know, Keynes, in, in a lot of ways, I think Keynes is sort of more of a philosopher than an economist. He kind of, he's this all-purpose intellectual who kind of backed into economics because it was, he was particularly good at it and people in the treasury would pay him money to do it. Uh, but, you know, he comes out of Cambridge and he's hanging out with people like Ludwig Wittgenstein and Bertrand Russell and these great philosophers who have ideas about beauty and truth and language and the, the nature of mathematics. And he wants to be one of these kinds of guys. And one of his earliest books is called The Treatise on P Probability. He doesn't publish it until 1921 because he's interrupted by the war, but it's a whole theory of human rationality and how we deal with the fact that we don't know the future. How, what, what does it mean to make a rational decision when you don't know how things are going to turn out? And, and this just, ends just up being- Just to get us back to what he, what he thinks in terms, of, in terms of the depression, he, he, or in, in both in, in the UK and in, uh, in America, he is saying we need to increase aggregate demand by putting money in either through government spending or in people's pockets that, that they can that they can go out and sort of jumpstart the economy that way, right? And this idea of aggregate demand is something that doesn't exist before yeah. Keynes talks about it. But before Keynes, people think of the economy as this sort of disembodied series of decisions that individuals are making under conditions of, you know, so, something like freedom, right? Um, Keynes comes to it more from the position of an imperial manager because he's working in the, tre the British Treasury during World War I, working on British war finance. He comes to look at the economy sort of as a system that, that both can and was managed by the British government during World War I. You know, the war economies of World War I and World War II were not market economies. The governments of the United States and Britain just took things over in order to, to make things more efficient and, and turn production towards war needs and not, you know, domestic uh, the, the sort of things that we buy every day in a, a non-war economy. Um, so, so Keynes sees that this is a system that can be managed, and he sees that you know there are things that you can get from a non-market economy. And in a lot of ways, um, he's trying to come up with a way to take the advantages of this this wartime economy and apply it to peacetime in 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 the depression. To try and take these insights that he's learned as an imperial manager and say, look, instead of spending all this money on bombs and battalions, you know, what what if we spend it on roads and bridges? And a lot of these insights become so embedded in the common sense of, of economics, even to some extent on the right today, that we don't even think of them as Keynesian anymore. I mean, the idea of infrastructure spending is no longer seriously controversial in Washington, DC. Even the US Chamber of Commerce, one of the most conservative sort of pro-business corporate elite lobbying groups in Washington, DC, is always agitating for more infrastructure spending. They don't usually come out and say, let's do more Keynesian public works right. because that sounds more money in and no, I, I, I always think when it seems to me conservatives have drawn a very artificial line um, as they try to, I think, have Keynesianism without, without the name, where they, they consider tax cuts non-Keynesian and public spending Keynesian. <laughs> but a tax cut, Keynes was agnostic, as I, as at least to the degree I know it, I'm basically agnostic. He might have a slight preference for, for um, public spending because a, n n less of that would be saved, whereas a, you, there was a propensity to save in a tax cut, but he would very much support a tax cut as a way to get money into people's pockets and get them buying things, wouldn't he? You know, it all depends on what the tax cut is and what the spending is. Keynes didn't support spending as such or, or oppose tax cuts as such. It, it depends on what they're trying to do. Uh, you know, in, in the general theory, one of the, the most famous kind of silly passages from this, this, you know, very great and complicated book, Keynes says, look, if, if we're 
we're, we're really up, up against it in, in a recession, it's still better for the government to bury banknotes in bottles and pay people to go dig them up than to not spend money at all. So he does think that there is a certain amount of, a certain boost that you get to just putting money in people's pockets, but it, he's not actually in favor of people right. burying banknotes in the backyard, right? He actually wants the governments to do these things. And a lot of his vision, I mean, the, the tools that he comes up with in the 1930s and 1940s for how to manage an economy, ultimately are used by liberals and conservatives alike over the next 75 years. There's really no sense in which um, Republican Party in the United States today, when it actually holds power and gov governs, is anti-Keynesian in the sort of uh, technical management of the economy. Ideologically, however, I think, I think there, are, there are very big differences. I mean, Keynes is coming to the profession of economics as a philosopher who's concerned with uh, a particular moral vision for, of, of the good life for, for individuals and for families, and then also for, uh, with a particular vision of a good society and what it means to be part of a good society. And that's shaped very much by his experience in the Bloomsbury set, where he's hanging out with people like Virginia Woolf and all these painters who are coming back from, from France and talking about their experiences with Pablo Picasso. And he marries this, you know, the, the most famous ballerina in Britain at the time, who's just fresh off an affair with Igor Stravinsky. So he's part of this very big, vibrant art world. And he thinks that that's really central to a, a meaningful, good society. He wants to democratize that kind of setting for the rest of for the rest of humanity. Um, some, of that, some of that set looks a little sniffly at him, don't, don't they? Too. He's the, he is, I understand it, the one non-artist in 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 Bloomsbury. And even though he ends up, uh, according to your book, supporting many of them uh, on, on the money he's made, they they tend to uh, kind of look down their nose just a teeny bit at him as a. Uh, not as a tradesman necessarily, but as a as an economic sort of you know as a government man. To, he's 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 doing the stuff that's very not cool. It's 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 very right. not punk rock to be working in the treasury, right? And these people are are you know esthetes who believe in the the, the you know universal transformative power of art and love, um, and they and they live it too. I mean, they uh, you know Bloomsbury sexually they're, they're just always sleeping with each other, and it all sounds ex incredibly stressful. Um, but but Maynard's kind of a square in this in this group. He works for the government. He's concerned about money and how money works. Uh, and what he wants to be, he can be a very good writer, but he's not a novelist like Virginia Woolf. Um, he, his sort of most important literary moments come when he's, you know, doing character sketches of uh, of great leaders. And you know, I want to read a couple of those from you, from your book that I, that I just loved. And this is uh, the from the economic consequences of the peace, which he, he wrote about the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and and uh, what what is one of his observations? He described Woodrow Wilson as a uh, blind and deaf Don Quixote. He said Lloyd George, then the uh, the British uh, premier, uh, was quote, this goat-footed bard, this half-human visitor to our age from the hag-ridden magic and enchanted wood of Celtic antiquity, which I thought was really good. I mean, he really was a great mean, writer. right? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and he also had this line, he said, I, but he, when, when people were annoyed at him over what he had said about Wilson, he, he noted that people would much rather be thought wicked than stupid. <laughs> so I mean, he really was. I mean, he was a he was a great writer, and he's known for. I mean, I probably most people know the line. Uh, he's talking about waiting for things in the long run, and him saying, "Well, in the long run, we're all dead." And then the other line, it, it tell, the line about changing the mind, which I know is people sometimes say that's apocryphal, but but it, it's attributed to him anyway. Could you talk about that just a teeny bit? Of it? Uh, sure. I mean, there, there's a. a, a... A, a quote that, that is out there in, in the ether yeah. where, where, where uh, s someone asks Keynes, you know, how dare you change your mind so often and be so inconsistent with your previous self? And he says, when the facts change, I changed my mind. What do you do, sir? Uh, I couldn't find any evidence that this actually happened. It may have, may have just not done enough research, but it's exactly the sort of thing Keynes would have said, which I think is why it has sort of stuck around in the cultural imagination. He has a way with words that I think really rivals Nietzsche for, with these maxims and aphorisms um, that uh, you know, certainly in the English language, I don't think we've had, we've had that kind of um, poet in, in public office or in, in positions of public power really since, um, since Keynes, but he's still not, you know, a great, artist the way his friends are. You know, Virginia Woolf writes several novels that are just clearly in the canon. Keynes cannot write a novel to save his life. There's no way that, that he could pull that sort of thing off. And his friends in Bloomsbury sort of 
are, are always writing him about it. And I think that really inspires him to become a more creative economist, to try to do what they're doing with art and letters for the economics profession, make economics into a sort of art, into a higher intellectual activity that's not just about you know, money and numbers and debt and deficits, but about creating a good society, about creating a cert making a certain vision of the good life possible for people like, like Virginia Woolf and Duncan Grant and, and these, these great artists who he's living with. So there, there he is, and, and we're in the, in the Depression. FDR is elected, uh, elected, I believe, running on a platform that calls for a balanced budget. Um, and it, he's in office looking to, looking to fix these problems, and Keynes has a pipeline, sort of a, lit, a, a, a letter pipeline to him, and he urges upon him, tell us about the policies a little bit. It's, it's just, it's fascinating the relationship between Roosevelt and Keynes, because for Keynes, Roosevelt is, I mean, Keynes just adores Roosevelt. He's not only uh, trying to do the type of reform, social reform that Keynes admires, um, Roosevelt comes from this very elite background, and yet he wants to aim the power of the government um, to help to help working people. Uh, and, and so he, he sees a lot of affinities between himself and Roosevelt. Roosevelt does not share the same warm attitude towards Keynes. He thinks Keynes is sort of this head in the clouds mystic. Um, he doesn't always understand what Keynes is talking about when Keynes presents him with actual figures. Um, but Roosevelt is surrounded by all these advisors who are quite deeply influenced by Keynes, first by his earlier ideas about money. And so when, when, when Roosevelt comes to office, he comes with a very concrete sense of, of wanting to reform the way the currency is managed, wanting to reform the Federal Reserve to move the United States off of the gold standard because he believes that the deflation that's been occurring over the course of the Great, the Great Depression is just, is just crippling and is, go, and is leading to political instability. He, he thinks that uh, fascism, in fact, is, is really on the rise in America and is going to, going to come to America if they can't do something about the continuous drop in prices. So his first move is to change the way monetary policy is managed, much in the way that Keynes had suggested doing uh, over the decade or so before he wrote the general theory. Um, but Roosevelt, you know, he's not personally super comfortable with, uh, with, with deficits when he comes to office, but he doesn't really have a whole lot of choices. I mean, the federal government is just hemorrhaging tax revenue because, of, because there's so much unemployment and so little production. So there, there aren't any revenues. And he wants to put people to work. And he's promised all of these great, you know, ambitious programs like the WPA and the Civilian Conservation Corps. And these ideas are super popular. The public wants him to do these things. And when he does them, they remain popular. People love the CCC and the, and the WPA. And when you do this, of course, you end up running a deficit. So he's trying not to the first couple of years, but he does it anyway. And I think those, those sort of you know, inadvertent deficits plus the monetary reform, uh, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to argue with the results. If you look at ec economic growth over the first three years of Roosevelt's tenure in office, uh, it's the highest peacetime growth that the United States has ever had, at least so long as these things have been measured. Uh, and it's only surpassed in wartime during World War II. Uh, when I think Roosevelt adopts a much more aggressively kind of Keynesian approach, uh, intentionally Keynesian approach to economic management. But he's getting throughout this entire period advice from people who have read drafts of the general theory, particularly by 1934, 1935, people who have, who have heard lectures about the general theory before it's written, uh, because he's hiring economists who come from Harvard who have been talking to other Harvard economists who have gone across and studied with Keynes at Cambridge while he's working these ideas out. So, some of the ideas are, are kind of in the ether. There are a couple of guys on, in the Roosevelt administration. Mariner, Mariner Eccles is one of them at the Federal Reserve. Lachlan Curry is another one who advises Roosevelt, who have these sort of rough and ready approximations of what Keynes develops into the, into the general theory. They don't have the sort of sophisticated scientific consensus and they, or, or theory behind it, and they don't have the sense of legitimacy that Keynes has as this great British intellectual. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, because Keynes is British, Americans are willing to look to him as this sort of like superior outsider from this, this august European sense. tradition, right? Um, yeah. Particularly elite Americans who, who have a tendency to kind of look down on, on other Americans from, you know, as, as bumpkins and uh, sort of backward people. So which is, which um, is just, just, just in passing here, what, one, of his, what, one of his great apostles in this country is, is John Kenneth uh, Galbraith, who is, uh, of course, a, a, a Massachusetts person, a Harvard person, or <laughs> was rather. And a, a huge amount of talent in that family. Uh, um, um, uh, Peter and, uh, and James are both, you know, his sons are just huge achievers themselves and, and fairly frequent contributors to the globe. But uh, so can you talk a little bit, let's take it forward to today. Now we, we move, we, we go through time, through decades, and there's what I consider a huge um, kind of consensus developing thing when Richard Nixon 
declares in early in his administration, I think it's in the administration, maybe in the campaign, that he is now a Keynesian. I mean, so when you have when you have the former Republican vice president become president saying, I now endorse Keynesianism, it would seem like a more or less complete victory for Keynes. And then yet over the next couple decades, sort of freshwater, Chicago school, neoliberal consensus takes sort of takes back the territory a little bit. Why is that, do you think? It's kind of a Pyrrhic victory, isn't it? I mean, Republicans had been kind of quietly doing Keynesian economics when they'd been in power prior to Nixon. Eisenhower certainly was running large budget deficits when he needed to turn the economy around, although he was doing so reluctantly. He just didn't broadcast the fact that he was doing it. Uh, whereas, whereas Nixon says, all right, look, I, I'm a Keynesian now. You know, I think a handful of things happen. Um, you have an, a problem intellectually in the workings of the way Keynesian economics has been developed by people like Paul Samuelson. And that's a technical problem we can discuss later. I think you have a political problem, however, with the fact that Richard Nixon and the way that he manages, he, he, the way that he does economic management, ends up becoming just deeply unpopular. Um, Nixon is trying to fight a problem called stagflation. And this is related to the theoretical problem I just mentioned. This is where you have both high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. Keynesianism, as it was developed by Paul Samuelson, and the guy who wrote the, the, the economics textbook that most people who studied Econ 101 either you know, got an Econ 101 or got a textbook that ripped it off. Um, Paul Samuelson comes up with, really popularizes this idea called the Phillips curve, that you can have high inflation or you can have high unemployment, but you can't have both. There's a trade-off between the two. And if you manage aggregate demand appropriately, you can kind of reach a, a, you know, some sort of balance where you might have low inflation and high unemployment or high unemployment and low inflation. But in other words, there's, there's no getting away from the fact that these two things are related. So when they're both going up together, you have a problem. And if you think Keynesianism is the Phillips curve and Paul Samuelson, then intellectually, the entire project seems deeply, deeply flawed. Now, Keynes never said anything about the Phillips curve. He might have had he survived to see the data, uh, but, but he died 12 years before this became you know, anything at, at, at all. At 62, right? Died, wasn't he? Yeah. Quite, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, 62 is not bad for a guy born in 1883, but uh, his family is, you know, very long lived. His mother and his father and his brother live into their 90s. So he is cut quite short. And it is it is really interesting to think about what he would have been doing yeah. in the 50s and 60s, because uh, certainly he was somebody who was not going to stop working. Um, he, he, lo he loved his work. But you, you have this problem where we're unemployment and inflation are rising at the same time. Nixon deals with it by putting in place some, some temporary price controls where he just says, look, we're freezing prices. They can't go any higher. Deal with it. Remember when that happened. Yeah. yeah. And, and he spends like crazy and he does a tax cut. Uh, and he says, look, we're going to juice aggregate demand. We're going to, we're going to deal with unemployment with these traditional Keynesian tools. And we're going to, we're going to stop the inflation that we think that this spending might cause by just prohibiting it. And he does it for a couple of years, and then he takes the price, and it works. It's very popular while it's, while it's in place. But then he takes the price control off. So empty. I can remember from the time there are things that you want that, that would, could not be produced in, in adequate supply at the uh, at the price that was that was uh, then allowed for it. But yeah. Oh, it it, it totally uh, it totally screws up all of the market feedback yeah. stuff. And and the United States, <laughs> it you know, for the most part, the United States did a better job managing its economy after uh, World War II than the Soviet Union did. But the Soviet Union was quite aware of these types of problems. So when the Soviet Union was imposing price controls and not running a market, you know, they would take into account what you know what the the you know suppose you know probable effects. Um, might be when they set a price at a certain point. So you would you would have you know long lines and queues like this, but they're actually better at managing shortages than Nixon was because it's a very short term thing. But nevertheless, unemployment goes away and uh, or is, is re reduced quite dramatically, and inflation does get under control, and Nixon's approval ratings go up quite a bit. He's reelected, in fact, uh, after you know what was not looking like a, a very a very good first term. But then as soon as he's reelected, he lifts the price controls, and of course prices go go through the roof. Um, and, and the project looks kind of like a failure, right? He, he's, he's called this Keynesianism. So now right. Keynesianism in the public mind is the way Nixon has managed the economy. Keynesian to academics is what Paul Samuelson has, has, has talked about. So the whole project looks like kind of a big mess, um, whether you're looking at it from a, you know, a high intellectual perch or just you know, a guy on the street. Um, and then Nixon is further discredited by Watergate. And, and frankly, Watergate, I think, um, is discrediting not just to Nixon, but to the sort of idea of a robust government taking strong action to, to do anything. I mean, it, it makes the government look corrupt because it is. 
and uh, and it, it makes the government look sort of violent and punitive because it is. So um, then we have Reagan who comes in under uh, and the, the next kind of exemplar of conservative thinking who who comes in under the theory of supply sideism that that sort of dependent on Say's law that 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 uh, the, the manufacturer of, of a product kind of creates the demand, you know, that supply creates its own demand. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, but, but if you look at any, and we have the, the, a lot of spending and big tax cuts, which uh, Gebreth always said were, were, that was backhanded Keynesianism. He would say, look, Reagan's saying one thing, and it, it, this is all supposed to be del driven on the supply side, but we don't really get the huge amount of investment. We don't, it, it really is a demand side recovery, at least as I understand it. And, and uh, we move forward through that. I mean, we, and conservatives consider it a huge success in their economic model, but I think it's really, you know, more Keynesianism. And we go forward to, uh, um, you know, uh, George W. Bush with, with their tax cuts after, after Clinton has essentially helped bring the, the budget back into balance. Isn't that Keynesianism too, really, what, what Bush is doing? Well, certainly, Galbraith referred to this, this style of Keynesianism as reactionary Keynesianism, um, spending on war, tax cuts for the wealthy. Uh, Galbraith actually developed that term to criticize some policies that were uh, advanced by John F. Kennedy when, he was, when Galbraith was working in, in the Kennedy administration. Kennedy wanted to do a tax cut, and he was spending a lot of money on, uh, on the Cold War. Um, and, and Galbraith opposed these things. He was a, you know, a good, good leftish liberal guy and, and you know, wanted, certainly didn't want to go into Vietnam. Um, and certainly didn't want to cut taxes for for the wealthy. So he he saw this as a as you know a bad model for economic management. But it's really easy to see why it's appealing to a conservative, because look, tax cuts for the wealthy and military spending are what Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush and now Donald Trump have been all about. I mean, they, they, these the question has not been in 20th century economics, or at least post war economics in the United States, whether the government will run large budget deficits and spend a lot of money. It's what it will spend that money on and yeah. who it will spend that money on. Well, no, a lot of people a lot of people are interested in this and have asked this some questions. I probably should have gotten to it earlier. But can you discuss the situation that we are in now? Are the remedies that we have seen so far Keynesian and um, what 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 more needs to happen from a sort of Keynesian model? Well, so I think it's really important to distinguish between Keynesianism as, as a sort of technical tools that were developed over the you know the decades after World War II, and and Keynesianism as the way sort of Keynes approached the problem of economics. Um, Keynes never wanted to be remembered as the sort of therapist of de deficits. He wanted to be remembered as someone who was tackling the great problems of his day. And to him, he thought the great problems were war, the march of authoritarianism, and of course, this Great Depression that was fueling both of them. So he wanted to be someone who, who was creative, who was like Virginia Woolf, not, not like uh, you know, Paul Samuelson or Milton Friedman. Uh, he didn't want to be thought of as a technocrat, even though he admired technocrats a great deal. Uh, so I think you know, it, it's, it's dangerous to say, uh, to sort of take somebody who is thinking that way to resurrect them and interrogate them on what they would do in the present moment. But I also think it's kind of fun to do. So um, if, if you look at the problems that we see today, I mean, certainly from a technical perspective, the stuff like expanding unemployment insurance, that's Keynesian in a very, very straightforward technical way. You're putting money in people's pockets, making sure their incomes are preserved so they can spend money on goods and services. Everything else though, it's a little bit tricky. This is a different kind of recession than the type of recession that we saw typically in the 20th century or even in the financial crisis of 2008. I mean, a lot of this recession is, is in a sense kind of self-induced. Self we're trying to shut down businesses. We're trying to limit production because we don't want people going around spreading a deadly plague. It's a different type of problem. And I think it's very tricky to ask yourself how, how Keynes would have approached this problem. Um, but I, I can say that he would have been ambitious about, <laughs> about, about yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Keynes was somebody who often tried to solve multiple problems with, with his economic remedies. You know, at the end of World War One, he wasn't just trying to, you know, make sure that growth could be could be strong in Europe. He's trying to remedy all of these terrible international tensions between nations with his economic program. He thinks economics is the sphere where you can pursue both social justice and international harmony. So I think Keynes would look around and say, look, we have this enormous breakdown in globalization that we've seen over the last you know, 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's been slowly breaking down, but certainly the last couple of years that that breakdown has accelerated. This is an opportunity for nations to rethink the way that they you know, they relate to each other and come up with a cooperative economic program, not just to address the public health crisis of, of the pandemic, but with how to exchange goods and services in such a way that when we run into crises like this, nations can count on each other to help lift, lift them, you know, each other out of, uh, out of the disaster instead of closing themselves off and, 
in many ways sort of hoarding the the resources that uh, that they need to treat their own citizens and keeping them from others. So um, I think he would be looking at globalization, and I think he'd be trying to trying to come up with something also on climate change at the same time. I don't really know how he would shoot the moon with this, but I think that's what he would try to do. Um, one of the things that, that that I found most interesting was uh, he had been a a classic liberal free free trader. I believe that the trade brought you the best of goods from around the world. Then he watched the way that uh, trade sort of the, the chaos or the dislocation it created in economies tended to dissolve the middle and maybe push different European countries toward fascism. And he became a, an advocate of protectionism or of a tariff, which I guess you'd have to say was protectionism. Now we're in this era where we have had for since NAFTA a free trade regime on, and and um, we have watched a certain hollowing out, and we've of the middle, and we've watched towns in the Midwest, cities in the Midwest that were were manufacturing dependent fall on hard times. We've seen on the left. Bernie Sanders become quite an ardent protectionist, and we've seen on the, on the right, Donald Trump become quite an ardent protectionist. Would Keynes, looking at our situation today, say, you know what, maybe free trade doesn't works theoretically, but doesn't work across a national polity in some way? Maybe maybe the the ramifications of it, the, the political ramifications, aren't worth the uh, aren't worth the cheaper prices. It's very tricky with Keynes when you talk about trade because he's um, deeply committed to the sort of internationalist vision behind free trade that, um, that, that the world has before 1914. The free exchange of ideas and, and culture and art and letters, all of this, he, he thinks that trade can bring you know, people closer together. And he has this idea before he knows anything about economics. It's really part of his, his sort of vision for what the British Empire is and what it can do. If, if the British Empire is doing free trade with all these different nations, then it's, it's not a predatory empire that's extracting resources here. There's some sort of mutual exchange. Everybody's doing democracy and prosperity together. Um, over the course of the 1920s and 1930s, as the international system, you know, leaders keep trying to restart the pre-1914 international system and failing. And Keynes eventually comes to say, look, the economic management of this stuff, the actual decisions that we have to make for how to keep people from starving or descending into fascism, that, that, the nuts and bolts of that can be different and separated out from the internationalist vision. We want arts and letters and culture to, to be international no matter what. But you know, maybe finance doesn't need to be international. Um, maybe bank lending is just not the sort of thing that works well across borders. Uh, and you know, he eventually does come around. He, he supports a tariff for a while in the 30s. But in 1944, of course, at Bretton Woods, he's part of recreating a new international system based on you know broadly free trade-ish types of internationalist co cooperation. He has a whole bunch of uh, exceptions that he takes to the United States in the way it's insisting on certain free trade terms, which he thinks will be devastating for Britain's manufacturing. And I think that was ultimately correct. But, um, but, but you know, he's, he's still, he, he never gives up on that internationalist vision. I think he would look at the type of globalization that we've had since the 1990s um, with, a bit of, with a bit of uneasiness. Um, he'd like the, the, again, the idea of bringing countries together with, you know, a shared set of ideas and uh, around fair play. Um, but I'm not sure that he would like the globalization of finance so much, which is really at the heart of the type of international system we've had mm -hmm. since the 1990s. Uh, I think he'd, he'd, he'd find that pr probably quite dangerous. Um, and certainly in conjunction with the increase in inequality, I think he'd find that very dangerous. The, the idea that Keynes cares about inequality for sort of just flatly moral reasons. He thinks it's just kind of gauche for people to have too much while other people don't have very much. But he also thinks that- And, and that's one of the questions yeah. people have asked. What, what would he say about inequality today? He would, be, he would be reasonably upset about it and looking for remedies for it, wouldn't he? Oh, certainly. You know, in, in the general theory, there's, there's a line where he says, look, we've believed that inequality is necessary to create these great fortunes that can then be invested in you know, all sorts of capital improvements, new factories, new ideas, whatever, uh, that without inequality, you won't have those fortunes, you won't have those investments. And so society can't move forward uh, in, in the ways that it has for the, you know, the previous centuries. And Keynes says, look, that's really not true if you believe my theory. My theory says you, you need to put money in people's pockets, otherwise those big capital investments will never be made because no, there will be no market for the goods that are eventually manufactured from them. So, he believes he's knocked down one of the justifications for inequality. And he says, 
you know, I think there's some justification for inequality of, of, of wealth, but certainly nothing close to what we have today. He's saying this in 1936. Um, Today, economic inequality is much wider in the United States than it was in 1936. Um, so clearly, the record of the critic of that. Another question uh, many people have, have written uh, to, to ask or emailed to ask is um, how much, what would Keynes say about the current state of debt and borrow, borrowing? People say, can we maintain, and this, I'll throw a bunch of questions into one here, can, can we keep on running $1 trillion deficits, yearly deficits in, in good times? Uh, and, and what is the limit that we can say in a, in a pandemic? I know you, there's no way to say this exactly, but but it, it, is it a near thing to say, geez, we're about at the limit that we can, we can borrow this way, or could you borrow substantially maybe another another 10 trillion if you if you had to to support? And I, I know I, I know I'm asking you something that's very hard to answer, but just your general. A lot of people are interested in this, so I throw it out there. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I, Keynes would, would want to re reformulate the question. He would, he would sort of reject the premise as significant. He, he would say that there isn't like a specific dollar amount that's going to be too much. Um, he, I think he would look at the United States, a country that controls its own currency, and say we, we should also be very clear about what we are risking with large deficits. We're not risking some sort of 2008-style financial crisis where the banks all fail. We're, we're risking something like elevated levels of, of inflation if we, if we run our deficits too high. Um, and there are tools to, to manage inflation. Not all of them are super attractive, but, but they do exist. Um, so he, he wants us to be careful with that, but he, he talked about, you know, not so much the size of the deficits, but maybe um, the shape of them, if, that, if that's a metaphor people can wrap their heads around. It matters what you spend this money on. Uh, you know, it, a tax cut for super wealthy people is not going to have the same types of ec uh, economic effects that a tax cut for, uh, you know, low income people has, or, 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 you know, some sort of straightforward subsidy for, for low income people has. Um, he, so he would say to get the demand into the economy, put the money in the hands of, of people who are more likely to spend it than, than sure. Yeah. sure. He, he would say that. But I think he would also say, look, when, especially in an era of crisis like this, where we have you know, the COVID economy, the thing to focus on is not the, the accounting deficits, but the movement of real resources in the economy. You know, there's a chance, you know, I, I think this is anecdotal, but you know, when I go buy meat now for groceries, it seems to me that it's significantly more expensive today than it was in, in March. That's not because the Federal Reserve is pumping lots of money into the economy. It's because we've had breakdowns in the supply chains and the production of meat. It's, there's just not as much of it and the price is going up. That's about the actual resources and production stuff that's, that's going on there. It's not about the sort of monetary things that are happening in the economy or in the, in the financial economy. So um, I think Keynes would say, look, let's focus on the real resources, focus on what resources we need to move where and for what reasons. And let's also look at our social goals. You know, all tax cuts aren't created morally equally to Keynes. He has a very distinct moral vision for society that he wants to see realized through economic policy. He really believes that economic policy is the place where social justice happens. I think he'd be very confused by the way in the United States we talk about economic policy on one hand and social issues on the other mm -hmm. as if they're separate sort of uh, separate sort of entities. So he would say unabashedly, you know, let's let's raise taxes on the wealthy because they have too much money and that's immoral. And let's let's lift people up because uh, we want to have we want to have lower inequality and it's good for people to have more things. Um, you know, there, there's a <laughs> an essay that he wrote in 1930 where he's talking about uh, it's called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. He's talking about in in a couple generations hence, he thinks it'll be possible for everybody to work 15 hours a week and spend most of their time on art and leisure and, you know, becoming, learning new hobbies and things Maybe like that. Maybe he meant 15 hours a day. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and obviously that never happened. I mean, we, we, we haven't, we've kind of moved in the reverse direction a little bit. It, it, well, it, it, it's interesting. It, it sounds more ludicrous today, I think, than it may have in 1930, because if you look at the, the development of the work week over the first 30 years of, of the, the 20th century, the work week actually is steadily declining, even in the, dep the, the Depression. Um, so there's, there's reason to believe that that, that, that will continue. Um, but of course, it doesn't. And, uh, and even though production and wealth have increased, I mean, if you look, if you run the numbers, it's pretty clear that if you take standard of living to be something like, you know, economic output per person, it is about where it would need to be for our, you know, our work schedules to, to line up this way. We just haven't seen, uh, seen, no, seen work standards move. Yeah. Well, let me ask this. I've always thought one of the, one of the practical, I mean, I think Kate's brilliant theory, but I think one of the, one of the practical and political difficulties with it is that while it is very easy to cut taxes and increase spending in bad times, 
it's never easy to increase taxes or even cut spending in good times. And I think Keynes would say that you, the thing are kind of bookends, right? That you need to be able to adjust on both sides of, of, of the economy, not just addressing bad times, but also what, taking advantage of good times to maybe get your, get your financial situation in a little better shape. And it, it seems to me that you just can't, I mean, it's, it's so hard in, in this country ever to raise taxes, whereas you read about, you know, even Winston Churchill would, would, could, was perfectly willing to come in on this budget and that budget and raise this tax and cut that tax. It wasn't, it wasn't quite such a political thing. But is that, a, is that an impediment, you think, that, that taxation reluctance? It's, it's, a, it's a complicated question because I think Keynes would want to know what we were trying to do with those tax increases. He wouldn't just support tax increases for their own sake. He would, he would support them if they were directed to a particular purpose, like you know, come, staving off inflation, probably a decent goal. But, but just balancing the budget for its own sake is not something that I think certainly later Keynes um, would, be, would be particularly concerned with. Um, so he, he would want to, to, you'd be very careful about you know, what taxes and why, but you know, Keynes is living at a time when the idea of shared national purpose, certainly in World War II, for instance, is not hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> the right. United States has a very clear national purpose. Britain has a very clear national purpose. In the 1930s, that had been falling apart all over, all over the world. And Keynes believes that you know, part of, of making society actually, in order to manage the economic system in any, in any sort of coherent way, uh, the government needs to have a coherent society that really is you know, glued together in some important social way. And if you have uh, an economic system where people don't feel like they're treated fairly, where they don't really feel like they're part of the same you know, organic human you know, mechanism, uh, then, then it's, it's just really hard to manage. Um, and so in that sense, I think he would see tax policy as a way of, of sort of helping society hang together and that certain tax increases on certain segments of the population could be really valuable. Um, certainly when you have these, you know, mega billionaires today who, you know, Jeff Bezos going around talking about how he doesn't know how to spend his money philanthropically. I mean, that's a statement that would just baffle Keynes. I mean, the mm -hmm. idea that you would not know how you would have so much money you didn't know how to spend is is crazy. And also, what's the point of having money? I mean, it's, you, you, nobody wants to have money. They want to have stuff. They want to go do things. They want to experience things. Um, so, you know, I, I, think, I think he would look at society today, the world today, and see all of this social fracture that we have and say, look, we need to, we need to, or, we need to develop economic policies to deal with this social fracture. After that, we can think about debt and deficits and you know, what's, what's too much and reverse engineer something to, that, that makes sense. But, but first of all, we've got to find a way to hang together. Two more quick ones, a little, a one a little out of left field here. Uh, one person wants to know, did the Spanish flu play a role in some way in his life? Absolutely. Uh, in, in, in the end of World War II, uh, there's this, or World War I, I'm sorry, there's this massive conference in Paris to negotiate the, the, the final terms of, of the peace. And this lasts about six months. And at this point, uh, this, there is a, you know, the, the Spanish flu, the, the pandemic of 1918 has been going for a very long time. Um, it probably, the, the, the actual virus has probably, uh, you know, evolved a little bit, developed in ways that's not quite as lethal as some of the strains that were going around earlier um, in 1918. But by 1919, when this conference is in full swing, um, getting all these people from different corners of the world to come together in one place, uh, not a great, <laughs> not a great way to prevent the spread of disease. And so a lot of people at the conference end up catching it. We think it's pretty likely that Woodrow Wilson had it, um, George Clemenceau had it, uh, and, and Keynes himself almost certainly gets it. He has a bacterial infection and probably a, a viral infection at the same time. And he, he writes, he's got a, a personal memoir of it, which is just vivid about being uh, impressed with horror by the movement of the patterns on his wallpaper. So he's hallucinating. <laughs> he's, so, he's so sick. And there's an entire floor of a hotel in, um, in, in Paris at this time, which is basically just converted into a makeshift infirmary for all the people who are coming down with the flu. And some, you know, some of the diplomats die. Um, uh, I believe Mark Sykes of the sykes pico Agreement, a very famous and, and you know, I think rightly derided treaty around World War I, uh, shows up and, and catches the flu and dies. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a major, major part of what's happening at the conference. It, it may, we, you know, we just don't have the medical, 
uh, ability to, to judge this with any certainty, but it may have uh, accelerated or, or created Wilson's uh, very rapid decline, um, which begins at the conference. And late, late, he has a series of strokes, which eventually leave him completely incapacitated and, and essentially unable to govern for the end of his, uh, his, his final term in office. Um, and some people think, you know, may have that, that you know, mental lack of acuity that's caused by perhaps this, uh, this virus maybe contributes to the final terms of the treaty, which Keynes certainly thought were, were terrible and unworkable. This may be a little specific for you, uh, but what would Keynes have liked better, Pulp Song, Common People, or Red Right Hand by Nick Cave in the Bad Seed? <laughs> uh, I've listened to some Nick Cave. I don't know if I'm familiar with Red Right Hand. Um, well, you got to listen to it. it. You know, it's it's the uh, it's one of the it's a theme song to Peaky Blinders, the uh, the series. <laughs> it, it's okay. really good stuff. Now, the last thing I want to ask you, we're just about out of time, uh, uh, and I just want to say, do you think will we arrive at a period? Do you think in in, in American policymaking where a president can be Keynesian in word as as well as deed? Well, I think it depends. The United States is really tricky right now. Um, the country is really fractured, um, not only along you know economic lines, but but you know, urban, rural, any metric you can come up with. Society really does seem to be splintering to me in important ways, and finding a leader who can bridge those um, those divisions is is really tough. I do think that the tools and ideas. Um, that Keynes developed over the course of his lifetime would be very useful to a leader trying to trying to bridge those divides, but you have to find someone who wants to do it. You know, um, I think in some respects, what Keynes is talking about uh, uh, <laughs> using the government to to make society more beautiful, to make society stronger, um, is something that intuitively appeals to a lot of people. But there are people who are just ideologically yeah. opposed yeah. to that project in the United States. Um, and so there will there would be a backlash against uh, any any type of major you know openly Keynesian effort to heal the country. Um, I don't know how strong that backlash would be. I think if it were effective, I think if if the, the policymaking actually worked and really did improve people's lives, um, did improve people's communities, then um, you know the backlash would be restricted to a small ideological faction of, of the country. Um, but I can see why why politicians would be hesitant to try that. Right. Um, I, I certainly worry that Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden, if he wins the election in November. Um, will have an awful lot on his plate, and I can see why he might be intimidated by the the project. But you know, Keynes certainly believed it, when the depression was uh, was at its worst that absent bold action, everything was going to fall apart. That you you had no choice but to take big steps that felt frightening and sort of like a step into the unknown. Um, and if but if you didn't do that, you could you could clearly see what was happening. And I think in the United States, look. I work for HuffPost. Um, my politics are relatively liberal. I'm not a fan of our current president. Um, I think liberals and people like me tend to think of the president as about as bad as it can get. But um, you know, things can always get worse. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we will end with that cheery thought. Yeah. Right, one more time. Uh, this is this is the book. Uh, everyone who's watching, it, it is a really good book. And Zach, thank you so much for for taking the time. I've really enjoyed the discussion. I hope I hope everyone who who uh, tuned in and uh, best of luck with the book. All right, thanks so much, Scott. I really enjoyed talking Thank to you. you.